Well, if you have your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> uh, again, we've been walking through uh, Deuteronomy and uh, been really pondering this idea. La- last time we were talking about this idea of love and what does it mean to love God. And we were kind of breaking down this word a little bit in the Hebrew, the Ahav word. And we were talking about the fact that uh, it's a covenantal kind of love that is based on the relationship that we have with God, that he has made a covenant with us. And as a part of that covenant, he says, okay, I want you to love me. But it's not an arm twist kind of love because th- this is a voluntary kind of love. That because of God's overwhelming love for us and the, the fact that he is the one pursuing, the, the fact that he's the one that's coming after us, that we are just responding to his overwhelming love in our lives. So it's a voluntary kind of love. And both of those, even though they're not emotional, in other words, they are a decision of the will to say, okay, God, regardless of circumstance, regardless of situation, I'm going to love you. Uh, the reality is that it is an emotional kind of love and that there should be an ever-increasing reality and intimacy and oneness and wonder with God's very person. And so we were kind of flushing that out last time, and I wanted to take it kind of one step further, if we may, this morning. And I want to give this idea that whatever we love, we become like. And it's just an interesting thought that I've just been really wrestling through. I've been been reading a book um, by one particular scholar, uh, Gary Beal, I think is his last name. And he's working through this idea, specifically looking at Isaiah chapter 6 and that whole amazing scene of Isaiah. And he basically is showing how the whole Isaiah 6 passage is tied into idolatry. So I've, I've been reading the book for when we get into more of the idol stuff. But one of the points he makes over and over throughout the book is this idea that we become that which we worship. That whatever you worship, you end up becoming like. And I like that terminology, but almost for my own sake, I would rather, I would probably say it, whatever we love, we begin to worship, and whatever we worship, we become. And then whatever we become, we end up worshiping. Which I want to flesh out a little bit more. So with that being said, I want to start with just reading the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6, just so it's in front of us this morning. And uh, then we want to dive a little bit deeper into all this. Uh, So Moses writes this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Uh, Again, Paul is talking and using that language of listen. Hey, will you shema, will you come under and listen to this reality? Uh, Will you not just, and again, it's not just hearing something, it's submitting yourself under and obeying it. And we were walking through this again in the last several sessions, but again, he says, you are to love the Lord your God. It's a covenantal, voluntary, emotional kind of a love, and you are just to aggressively go after God. Now, in the next couple of sessions, we're going to look at what does it mean to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your your might. Uh, But again, I, I I want to emphasize this idea that isn't it Isn't it interesting that whatever we focus on, whatever we love, we become like? That you become like what you love. Uh, Culture has these mindsets. Uh, For for example, uh, we say stuff like, oh, you become what you think about. So whatever you put your mind upon, eventually that becomes your reality. And and when that's reality, uh, you start to live your life in conjunction or in alignment with that thought process. So whatever you dwell upon, eventually you will become that. Uh, In the health world, uh, we have the language of you are what you eat. I'm surprised like I'm not a big Cheeto or something. (laughs) Actually, I don't eat Cheetos. But but you know that that's not what we're meaning by that. But the idea is if you're putting a whole bunch of junk food in, actually, it would be chocolate. That's what I would be. I would be a whole bunch of chocolate. That would be so good. (laughs) Man. And Nathan does mean gift. So this, there's, just, there's, there's, some, there's some depth in this. Dark chocolate. Oh, what a gift. But the whole idea, oh, sorry, I got distracted. The whole, the whole idea uh, in the food thing is that if I, if I input a lot of junk food, it actually changes my cells and my body will start to break down. If I eat a lot of health food, supposedly, it's supposed to aliven my body and bring health and vitality and, you know, energy to all my cells. And I haven't seen that happen, so I just keep eating the chocolate. So, 
though, that, though we use those statements in a cultural sense, that really is true spiritually. That there is a truth spiritually that, that whatever I begin to focus on, whatever I just begin to love, whatever I begin to worship, that is what I become. And there's this interesting idea with the biblical concept of idols. And again, I haven't really got into the idol stuff yet, but I just want to tease this thought out. There's this idea biblically that you eventually become what you give your focus, attention, and life to. And that, that thread, specifically tied in with idols, weaves itself all through Scripture. And let me just give you a couple of passages, and I want to talk about this. At the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, God creates humanity. And, and this is what it says in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle of all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. We were made in the image of God. And in a future study, I'm really going to flesh this out because it has been so profound in my mind, that we are image bearers. And what an idol is, is an image. It's an image bearer. And in a strange sense, do you realize that God says, nothing is to represent me except you. Then in weird thought, that when the world looks at your life, they are to see the majesty and the glory and the very presence of the Lord. That the whole earth should know that there is a God. Why? Because they see you. Maybe better stated, they see him in you. So here's, here's what Beal says, just as a, as a teaser. He says, at the core of our beings, we are imaging creatures. It is not possible, possible to be neutral on this issue. We will either reflect the creator or something in creation. In other words, we are image bearers. We, we are going to represent and reflect something. And either we are going to showcase the wonder of who our God is, or we are going to showcase something of this world. We will represent something. We are going to become like something. Well, what do we become like? That which we focus on and love and worship. And so you, you begin to see just a hint of that at the very beginning. That, that your life is to reflect only one thing, God Almighty, which is a pretty big thing person. That your life should not showcase any other reflection, any other glory, except the one in whom it all deserves, in whom deserves it all. And yet what you begin to see is that all through the Old Testament, humanity begins to showcase not God, but idols. Uh, for example, in uh, Psalm 115, verse 4 and 5, uh, listen, listen to what the psalmist says. This is Psalm 115, verse 4, and 4 through 8, sorry. Psalm 115 says this, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. Now listen to this. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. So they're describing the idols. And basically they're saying, well, they're just pieces of wood or pieces of silver or pieces of gold. Yeah, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, they cannot hear. They have feet, but they can't walk. But then listen to the next statement in verse 8 about those who put their trust in them. It says, those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. And there's an interesting principle in the passage that, all right, here are these idols, and they're deaf, and they're dumb, and they have no ability to do anything, and yet if you put your trust and your hope in those idols, you actually become just like them. You become deaf. You become blind. Uh, Psalm 135 says, Almost the exact same thing. It's a parallel passage. In Psalm 135, verse 15 through 18, it says, The idols of the nations are but gold, sorry, but silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in all their mouths. 
Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. So there's this idea that those who make idols become like idols. That they become blind, that they become deaf. And what's interesting is that language, that those sensory organ language of like ears and eyes and mouths, God begins to use this over and over, that language throughout the prophets, to talk about the reality of what his people become when they put their trust in anything else but him. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21, God is speaking through Jeremiah and he says this, Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, nor ears, who have ears but do not hear. So God's speaking through Jeremiah, and he says, okay, I want you to speak to the people, and I want you to tell them, hello, people who are blind and deaf. Well, what is he using? He's using idol language. He's using that language to talk about what happens when you follow idols. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 2 says, O son of man, you live in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but do not see, Ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious house. God says, Ezekiel, do you know what you're doing? You are living in a, in a time and a place where you are surrounded by a whole bunch of deaf and blind people. Why? Because they're rebellious. They have actually turned from me. You hear that language even in Romans chapter 1. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking about the fact that here is humanity, and they've been made in the image of God, but yet they've turned from God to serve everything else but God. And what did God do? He actually allows them, he gives them over to become just like what they want, the thing that they love. So you get, and I'll read the passage in just a second, but you get this idea that when I put my affections upon an idol, when I put my attention upon that which is false, God allows my life to become like that which I love. He's like, okay, if you love it that much, fine, become it. And what's interesting is it's like the judgment, part of the judgment for that sin is contained in the giving over and me becoming like that which I love. So when I become like an idol, the judgment is on idolatry, and therefore me becoming like the idol, there's a judgment in that. Does that make sense to you? So take that and listen to what Paul says in in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, verse 22 through 26 He says, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, again, this is an idolatry language, for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in their lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. So are you starting to pick this up? There's this idea throughout Scripture that whatever I set my affection on, whatever I put my attention to, I I start to become like that. that. That if I start to love idolatry, if I start to love the things of this world, I actually just become that. That's a dangerous thought, isn't it? Or a scary thought? That the moment I put my affection on anything but God, I become like that thing. But then here's the spiritual principle. What if my affections were on God alone? Do you realize I become like the thing that I love the most? And I become more Christ-like and more godly if he is my focus and my attention and my love? So Beale sums up this principle or the concept this way in the book. He says, the principle is this. If we worship idols, we will become like idols, and that likeness will ruin us. And we got to remember that when we're talking idolatry, idolatry is far more than just wood and silver and gold kind of stuff. That is, that's anything that is not Jesus. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 12 It says, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but its its end is the way of death. Isn't it interesting that when when I come in and revert into myself and I decide to 
reason with myself and decide within myself, Nathan, what is the best course of action? Nathan, what is the right thing to do? You realize rarely do I pick the right one. I pick the easy, the comfortable, the pleasurable, the whatever. And typically, what seems right in my life, out of my own reasoning, usually leads to death. What is that? It's a self-idolatry. Uh, when you look at stuff like Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, listen to what Paul says. He says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to Im- immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So Paul is taking in a concept of, okay, here are these physical idols. Yeah, that's idolatry. But even more than the physical idol, there's spiritual idolatry. Well, what's spiritual idolatry? Anytime I give my affection to something other than Jesus. So whether it's impurity or immorality or passion or evil evil desire or greed, that becomes idolatry. Uh, He says the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, but immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you, which doesn't mean we don't talk about it. It means it shouldn't be even in your life. In other words, if someone was to go through your life with a fine-tooth comb, there would be nothing there to talk about. So he says, immorality, impurity, and greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He says, do you realize that there's a spiritual idolatry that happens in your life? Well, what kind of stuff is that? Impurity and immorality and greed and covetousness. And and when I give my affection to the things of this world, I become like the world. And I become an idolater. Uh, Martin Luther said this. He says, whatever your heart clings to and relies upon, that is your God. Trust and Trust and faith of the heart alone make both God and idol. The idol is whatever claims the loyalty that belongs to God alone. So whatever you put your trust in, whatever you put your focus in, that becomes your idol. And the biblical principle is, I become like my idols. Have you noticed that whatever you focus on <clears throat> tends to grow bigger and stronger in your life. COVID happened, you know, some time ago. I'm trying to push it as far back as possible. But it's amazing. When people were putting their focus on the craziness, do you realize the craziness only got bigger and bigger in their life? Uh, when you put your focus on fear, fear grows bigger and stronger in your life. <clears throat> and that is always true with sin. That when I put my focus upon sin, sin will always grow bigger and stronger in my life. So what if the focus of my heart was not upon the sin, it wasn't upon the fear, it wasn't upon the craziness? What if the focus of my heart was upon Jesus? Do you realize that if I would keep my focus steadfast upon the Lord, He would grow bigger and stronger in my life? And by the way, that that is a key of how you can win victory over temptation. Because when we're we're looking at temptation, the moment my focus goes upon the temptation and I remove my focus off of Christ, you realize that temptation gets bigger and stronger in my life and eventually I'll cave in and give in to it. So what if I didn't heed the temptation? Yeah, the temptation may pop up, but what if I would immediately turn my gaze upon the Lord and say, God, you've got it. You've got to keep my attention. You've got to keep my focus. You've just got to keep my... And in the midst of keeping my focus there, do you realize the temptation just is no longer much of a temptation? Uh, as a cheesy illustration, which I've given so many times around here, uh, imagine I say for the next 10 seconds, you can think about anything you want but a pink elephant. Ready? Go. You can think about anything but pink elephants. Don't think about pink elephants. Stop thinking about pink elephants. No pink elephants. Seriously, stop thinking about pink elephants. What are you thinking of? A pink elephant. Well, why is that the case? Because you're trying not to think about it. Don't we handle sin and problems like that all the time? 
It's like, you know, you're driving down the road and you see a billboard that shouldn't be there. And our first thought is, don't think about the billboard. 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 All you're doing is thinking about the billboard. See, what if you had something better to think about? What if you had something better to put your affections upon? What if you would turn your gaze from the billboard or the sin or the temptation and keep it upon the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, would you just, would you capture me and captivate me and pull me in and woo my heart? Because you have something better to think about. And I can almost guarantee you without fail that for the last 30 seconds, you've not once thought about a pink elephant. Why? Because you had something better to think about, hopefully. (laughs) wouldn't that be amazing if that was true with Jesus in our lives? That rather than just becoming like the idols around us, we kept our focus upon the Lord. Which is why I, I love this idea of what Moses is doing with the Shema. The Shema was a daily reminder to turn your attention and affection upon the Lord. That it was a daily reminder to say, Lord, I love you with all that I have and all that I am. And somehow, in the pursuit of declaring and pressing it and loving God, not just because I have to, not just because it's a covenant, covenantal requirement, but because it's a voluntary decision and I, oh, I want to because I love him dearly. When that becomes the motivation of my heart, do you realize that that which I focus on and love actually grows bigger and stronger in my life, and I become like that? I become like him. At Romans 8, 29 Love this verse. Romans 8, 29, Paul says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know what God's desire for your life is? He wants to conform you to the image of Christ. Well, what what does that mean? That means whatever in your life that doesn't look like Jesus, he wants to cut away. And I, I keep using the idea of that Play-Doh, right? If you take Play-Doh and you shove it into a plastic mold, the Play-Doh is conformed to the image of that mold. And if you look at Romans 8, 28, it says that God is using every circumstance, the good, the bad, and the ugly, for his purpose and his plan. Well, well why is God using all things for your good? It's not just so that he can use all things for your good. He's using all things for your good so that he can shove you into a mold called Jesus and make you look like him. That you are to look Christ-like. That, that you are to become godly in this very ungodly world. And so God is using every circumstance in your life to shove you into a mold that looks like Jesus and then cut away everything else. Well, how's that going to take place? You've got to make him your love. Because when you make him the love and the center of your focus, do you realize he's going to grow bigger in your life and you become like him? Or Colossians 3.10 which says, put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Do you realize that you are being renewed according to the image of the one who created you? That he's making you look like himself. Or I love 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says that seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises. So that by them, get this, that you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. That is such a crazy thought to me. That everything that you need for life and godliness is found in one place. Jesus. And what is he doing in your life? He is enabling you. He's inviting you in. He's wooing your heart so that you would become a partaker of his divine nature. That you would actually share in his nature. Now that is so ridiculous. Now that does not mean you become God. You do not become God. Praise the Lord. (laughs) But somehow he invites us into such an intimacy and a relationship that we get to share in his nature. Can I ask you, what is it that you're reflecting and becoming? That you are a reflecting creature. You are made as an image bearer. You are going to reflect something. 
So what do you reflect? And I know I know what the right answer is because you know in the church we know we don't we know the right we don't know the right answer. It's Jesus. But genuinely, how do you know what you're reflecting? How do you know what image you're bearing? Look at what you love. What do you put your heart towards? What do you give your attention to? What summarizes your life? Listen to this quote. People resemble what they revere, either for ruin or restoration. God has made all people to reflect, to be imaging beings. People will always reflect something, whether it be God's character or some feature of the world. If people are committed to God, they will become like him. If they are committed to something other than God, they will become like that thing, always spiritually inanimate and empty, like the lifeless and vain aspect of creation to which they've committed themselves. I, I wish I could have you grab a hold of this concept. But do you realize that what you love, you will eventually worship? And what you worship, you will eventually become. And what you become, you love all the more. Which means you worship it more, which means you become like it more, which means you love it more, which means you worship it more, which means you become. Are you getting this? Do you realize that if, if I put money as my love, then I will start to worship money and give all my time and energy and affection to the money, and I get so wrapped up in that, I become a greedy, covetous person. But that becomes okay with me because I really love money, which makes me love or makes me worship money all the more, which makes me even more of that, which makes me love, which makes me worship, which makes. What if you could plant a cross smack dab in the middle of that pattern? What if God could redeem your love? I had an old uh, gentleman who was a good friend, and he, he said, Nathan, when, when God radically got a hold of my life, I could genuinely tell you I had not much desire for godly things. He says, but when I actually gave my love and my heart to Jesus, everything that I used to like, everything I used to pursue, everything that used to just be the obsession of my soul, he stripped that out and made him dislikes. I didn't even like him anymore. And all those things, the, all the godly things I just didn't like, he now gave me such a love and affection for. I just, oh, I couldn't help myself. Is it possible for God to take all of your sinful likes and turn them into dislikes? And all of your godly dislikes and turn them into likes? Well, how's that going to take place? You need a cross stamped in the middle of your life. Now, wouldn't it be just amazing if the love of your heart truly was Jesus? Wouldn't it just be amazing if, if the, the throb of your being was God Almighty? And somehow, as you go after him and as you pursue him, the promise is he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And somehow, when you genuinely love God, worship is not a chore. In fact, no one has to say, everyone stand up and let's sing a song. Smile. Right? No one has to do that to you. Why? Because you just, you just can't help yourself. You, just, you hum all throughout the day. You don't even realize you're doing it. Roommates poke at you saying, shh, I'm trying to study. Why? Because you just, you just can't help yourself. You're just lost in a wonder of who he is. And, and it's amazing that the more I go after him and the more that I love him, the more I just begin to worship him. And we're not talking worship just in the sense of singing. We're talking worship in the sense of life. That you give your time and energy and focus and life to that, that which you love. And wouldn't it be amazing that as I'm just lost in this wonder of love for God that I just, I just can't help but worship. And in the midst of worshiping, he drags me in and, become, and I become more Christ-like. That I, as I share in his nature, he actually makes me holy. He consecrates my life. He, makes, he sanctifies my life. He he makes me more and more look like Jesus. And in so doing, I just, I'm overwhelmed by him, and therefore I love him more. And Is that true in your life? 
Not, not just in what you say, because I know the right church answer. Is that true in your life? I mean, is God truly the center of, of your love and of your worship and of your life? I just want to close with this declaration that Joshua made uh, before he died. At the end of Joshua, Joshua 24, verse 14, listen to what Joshua commands the people. He says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Go after our God, says Joshua. Can I encourage you to do the same thing? Would you be willing to put away all the, all the affections, all the addictions, all the habits, all the whatever has been clinging to your soul and say, Lord, I want to go after you? And somehow it's, it's the pursuit and going after him and him drawing you into greater worship and Christ-likeness. You realize that all those habits and all those addictions and all those, they lose their power. There's that old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That somehow it's beholding him. And in the midst of beholding him, it's just, it's not gritting my teeth and saying no as much as, eh, I just don't desire that stuff anymore. And I understand that may take some time, but would you turn your affections to Jesus and let him begin to just woo your heart? Because the reality is, is whatever you love, you will worship. And whatever you worship, you will become. And you'll either become Christ-like and godly because you're loving and pursuing the Lord, or you'll become like the idols in which you are pursuing, and you'll become blind and deaf and made for destruction. Will you go after Jesus afresh? Let's pray. Lord, Lord, we desperately need you uh, Lord, we don't want to just talk about you. Lord, we don't want to just nod our heads and say the right words. And Lord, we want actually you. Lord, we don't want to say that we love you. We actually want to love you. And we understand that in a covenantal, voluntary, emotional kind of love, it, this is going to have to result in action. That we can't just give lip service, I love Jesus, and then still go and off and do our own thing. Lord, we, we're going to have to obey. We're going to have to press in. We're going to have to pursue. We're going to have to seek after. We're going to have to delight ourselves in. But Lord, truth be told, if we would just see you, if we would just get a taste of who you are, Lord, I am convinced we just could not help ourselves. We would be so overwhelmed. And the reason we can so easily love you is because you first overwhelmingly loved us. So, Lord, I pray that you would just cause our gaze to turn heavenward. I pray that you would open your word in our lives, and as we get to know you, the one true God, we just, oh, we just, our affections would be stirred, and we just could not help ourselves, and, and we would just, oh, we would love you. And, Lord, may that love turn into true, genuine worship, not just with singing, but with every aspect of our living. And through that, Jesus, could, could we become more like you? Would you make us Christ-like? Would you make us godly and holy in this very godless age? May this world just be stunned. Not by us, but because we're reflecting you. We are image bearers, showcasing the wonder of who you are and your spirit within our lives. And Jesus, this morning, we do want to genuinely worship you. We don't want to sing songs. We want to worship. So, Lord, could you, could you just somehow bubble up within us a, an overwhelming love for you? Because truth be told, Jesus, I can't love you the way I want to love you. And somehow I need you in me to love you more. So would you do that this morning and may we just come and behold and worship and seek and surrender and find ourselves just lost in who you are. 
becoming more and more like you. Love you. We give you the praise and the glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen.